Welcome to Hope for Today, a weekly Bible teaching program that will bring you hope for every day. It is good to be with you as we study God's Word together. The Bible is a book, but it isn't just a book. It is different. It is living. And it is for our own good that we spend time in its pages. Today's title is is a fool for God's glory. And the verses are from 2 Corinthians 11. As humans, most of the time, we are concerned with how others view us. However, there are certain times when it doesn't seem we care a bit about what others are thinking. For example, when I was teaching school, the students and I would discuss how they cheered for their friends at a game. When their friend was playing a sport, most students didn't care one bit what others thought about them as they cheered on their team. Paul had a similar mindset. His guiding principle was doing everything for God's glory. In this lesson, he does not care that others may think he's a fool. He is focused on God's glory. What matters more than your reputation? What are the things in this life you're willing to do, no matter what others think? Are you willing to be a fool for God's glory? Let's go with J. Mark to the last half of 2 Corinthians 11 and learn together from this passage. Nobody wants to be called a fool. We all aspire to be perceived as intelligent and understanding and wise. But you know, if you and I choose to follow Christ, those who don't share our faith, they may consider us to be fools. Our study in 2 Corinthians is from the closing verses of chapter 11. And here Paul refutes the accusations of the false teachers in Corinth. As we look at this text, we'll see his profound discomfort as he feels compelled to defend his calling and his ministry. He uses these terms, fool and foolishly, several times in this text. Sometimes he applies those words to himself and sometimes to those who are critical of him. And yet his ultimate stance is that he himself is willing to be a fool for God's glory. That's our title for today's study, A Fool for God's Glory. And our text is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 16. Listen as I read. I say again, let no one think me a fool. If otherwise, at least receive me as a fool, that I also may boast a little. What I say, I say not according to the Lord, but as it were, foolishly, in this confidence of boasting. Seeing that many boast according to the flesh, I also will boast. For you put up with fools gladly, since you yourselves are wise. For you put up with it if one brings you into bondage, if one devours you, if one takes from you, or if one exalts himself, if one strikes you in the face. To our shame, I say, we were too weak for that. But in whatever anyone is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prison more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, perils of mine own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, and in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness. And besides the other things, what comes upon me daily is my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God 
and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor, under Aratus the king, was guarding the city of Damascus with a garrison, desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. In these words that Paul wrote to the Corinthian believers, we observe the several stages that describe being a fool for God's glory. And these stages are applicable to your life and mine as well. So let's look at them. The first stage of being a fool for God's glory is speaking as a fool. Paul acknowledges that boasting isn't from the Lord. But because of the situation in Corinth, he said, I feel compelled to boast about what I've done in God's service. So he said, since the false teachers are boasting according to the flesh, then I will do the same. He wanted them to know that he was not inferior in any way to these false teachers. And then in verse 19, Paul writes sarcastically, Since you are so wise, you gladly entertain fools. You tolerate tyranny, extortion, craftiness, arrogance, violence, and even insult. In verse 20, he mentions them allowing the false teachers to strike them in the face. And in that culture, being struck in the face was a grievous insult. Paul was horrified that they were allowing their leaders to abuse them. He had never done that. While he had been firm in dealing with their sins, he had been gentle and meek among them. His whole ministry was about building people up, not tearing them down. And then in verse 22, Paul lays out the proofs of his devout Jewishness. Hebrew represents his nationality. Paul was an ethnic Jew. Israelites represent the covenant people of God. The seed of Abraham represents the messianic privilege. Now we know that Paul initially rejected this privilege, but now he is wholeheartedly embracing it. Even today we have false teachers who exercise power without accountability. They abuse their authority. They threaten those who disagree with them. Some of them deal deceitfully with people and with issues in the church, while others use their position as a club to enforce submission. Like Paul, you and I must warn those who have fallen under the influence of false teachers. We show our care for them by building them up rather than destroying them. Like Christ, we must be willing to suffer abuse for our gentleness. Paul possessed every qualification that the false teachers claimed for themselves, but he is ashamed of his boasting about those qualifications. You and I should have that same hesitancy to boast in our self-defense. The next stage, then, of being a fool for God's glory is suffering as a fool. In this section, Paul moves from asserting his equality with false teachers to saying that he is, in fact, superior. He says, Are they servants of Christ? I speak as a crazy person. I am more. To prove his claim, then, he gives a long list of things that he suffered for the cause of Christ. How could one man endure so much suffering? His constant companions were backbreaking labor, trouble, and toil. He was severely beaten five times, thirty-nine lashes each time with a leather whip, and three times he was beaten with that same amount of strokes with a rod, and a beating by either one of those could be fatal. He was frequently in danger of physical death. He was stoned and left for dead at Lystra. He was shipwrecked three times and he was adrift on the water far from land for 24 hours. We know nothing of these because they are all before his shipwreck in Acts 27, which occurred much later in his life. And then he also faced dangers from raging rivers and tribal bandits in Asia Minor. He faced danger from his countrymen, fellow Jews who bitterly resented his embrace of Jesus as the Messiah. He faced it from Gentiles like the mob in Ephesus that rioted in support of the silversmiths. And he faced danger in the wilderness, on the sea, and among those who pretended to be his brothers in the faith. He said, I experienced much weariness of the flesh and spirit, much physical pain, and many sleepless nights. Hunger and thirst were my constant companions. He often lacked adequate clothing. All of this suffering must have taken its toll on his physical and mental health. 
But there was something that was even more concerning to Paul. And he tells us what it is in verse 28. He says, Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. His deep concern for the churches was like a mob of hostile rioters rushing upon him. He knew what that was like, a sense of helplessness and suffocating fear. Paul keenly felt the struggles of those he had led to Christ, and he suffered with them. With the weak, he became as weak. When a brother or sister was made to stumble, Paul was overcome with grief. He cared deeply for those under his spiritual care, and he was willing to endure all of this suffering to see Christ formed in them and for them to become spiritually mature. Are you willing to suffer as a fool for Christ? Are you willing to endure even the smallest part of Paul's suffering? How deep is our love for those God has placed under our spiritual care? Do their successes bring us joy? And do their failures bring us grief? Are we willing to stand in the gap to protect our people from false teachers? Do we uphold the weak and support those who are stumbling? To the world looking on, it seems pointless to live that way. But as Christ's followers, we must be willing to suffer as fools for his glory. The final stage then of being a fool for God's glory is boasting as a fool. When you and I boast, we magnify our strengths. That's normally what we do. But notice what Paul said. He said, if I have to boast, then I will boast about the things that display my weakness. Now, who wants to do that? That's ridiculous. The things Paul suffered seem so outlandish that he takes a solemn oath that it is entirely accurate. The proof of Paul's apostleship was in the power of Christ, who kept him through an incredible list of trials. It wasn't Paul's strength or greatness that made his ministry successful. It was God's strength. In the final verses of our text, Paul mentions his humiliating experience in Damascus. Acts chapter 9 records what happened. This one who envisioned entering the city in triumph with letters from the high priest fled the town several weeks later at night being let down over the wall in a basket. That experience moved Paul from the ranks of the persecutors to the ranks of the persecuted. And it indicated the sufferings that would come to him in his service for Christ. And it is in those sufferings that Paul determined he would boast. Like the Apostle Paul Are you willing to be a fool for God's glory? We all want people to think well of us, to like us, to hold us in high regard and think we're wise. But the teachings of Jesus and the apostles make it clear that if we follow their example, we'll most likely be considered foolish. The only way we can truly live as a fool for God's glory is if you and I, like Paul, believe the gospel and act upon the eternal rewards that are promised. If we choose the acclaim and approval of the world, we will suffer eternal loss. But if we embrace the foolishness of the cross, we will experience eternal bliss in the presence of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you choose to be a fool for God's glory? Thanks, J. Mark, for sharing these points for how we can also be a fool for God's glory. Most of us haven't experienced all that Paul went through. Yet each of us can embrace the cross, believe the gospel, and live it out where we are. Thanks so much for being with us for this teaching. If you have any questions about the teaching, or if you'd like to hear it again, please let us know. The best way to contact us is email, and our email is hope at heraldsofhope.org. Or you can connect with us on our website, which is heraldsofhope.org. We'd love to hear from you no matter how you choose to contact us. As I was thinking about being a fool for God's glory, it reminded me of the popular quote from Jim Elliot, and I give you this to think about as you go. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. 